trying to say is that there has to come a time in all of our lives that we have to learn to trust. And, uh, uh, and so pleasing God is not supposed to be our number one goal in our relationship with God because people that are trying to please God, if you've been to the Philippines, especially during the, the um, um, Easter season, um, many of the religious people, leaders, the Christians there will nail themselves to the cross so they can feel the pain of Christ. Many of them will make up their own cat of nine tails, which is razor blades and uh, shards and, and pieces of um, uh, glass and whip themselves until they're bloody because they want to show how much pain they're willing to endure to serve God. And, do, and, and they're not doing this in the name of Buddha. They're doing this in the name of Jesus. And so they will put themselves through suffering because they want to to prove to God how much they love them and how much they're willing to go through to show God that they want this relationship and they want to be close to God. Now, you see, this other door, pleasing God, will really mess you up. Now, you might say, well, how can I, well then, you know, how can God be pleased with my life? First of all, you got to trust Jesus. And when you trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the Bible tells us that he's the one that paid the price for all of our sins, all of our inconsistencies, all our indiscretions, all of the things that are wrong with us, all of our failures, all of the screwed up, messed up stuff. Like we used to say when we were kids, he was hung up for our hangups. Praise God. And the Apostle Paul says that we have been declared righteous. A declaration by God, we have been made. We have been made righteous. We can't make ourselves righteous. And then, you know, Paul also says that our righteousness is of him, Jesus, and not of ourselves, unless we would boast about it. How good I am. <laughs> That's what we would be. I'm such a good person. But it's not about the ability of humanity to be good. Now, religion says it's about the, the ability of humanity to raise themselves from the pit and become this evolved, um, enlightened being that's able to look at God face to face on their steps to an enlightenment, which means it's, it's a self-religion. Now... I'm saying all this on the top because of what I'm teaching and preaching about. We have to understand that we have received something so precious and so wonderful from God, which is the gift of salvation, which is the most envied wealth that could ever be given to anybody on earth. Something to be cherished. Uh, somebody, oh, oh, uh, right quick, um, Marcel, put it on the board, uh, 100 songs, 100 songs. Put that up. So I, I'm teaching on the balance of life. Most people, the problem th that they have in life is their life is just out of balance. It's not that they don't have life, but their life is out of balance. And when your life is out of balance, you always feel like there's something wrong. You can't be satisfied. You can't. It just seems like, you know, you're depressed, but you don't know why you're depressed. You know, now I'm not talking about somebody that's perhaps clinically depressed, but I'm talking about, you know, uh, everything's gone right in your life. Every, or some, for most people, things are gone, but you just can't. You just can't. Uh, have that state of, uh, you know, life is good, life is okay. You know, when the birds sing, you can't hear them, you know. 
um, when it's a rainy day like it is a lot in Seattle, you can uh, look past the gray and understand it's the gray that makes the green. <laughs> You know, you can't you can't look past that. All you can, all you see is, is is the gray. You know, uh, you get you don't like to walk because there's stones in the road, and you once tripped on one, and so you don't walk anymore. You know, you don't understand that life is in the journey and not in the sit down. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? You can't, you know, you, you haven't got that yet, you know? And, and, and some of us are afraid of the journey because we don't know what's going to confront us on the journey. And so we don't even want any part of the journey because we don't know what we're going to face because journeys are adventures and adventures, anything could jump out on your path. You know, it could be a, a cat that runs across the road or even a snake that slithers across the road, but you're on the journey. Most of us, we don't, we don't want that journey because that journey, it winds sometimes. It's not, always, it's not always just like, oh, wow, I can see where the path has taken me. If you're taking a walk in the woods and on a path, sometimes the path will wind into the trees. But you'll look forward and all you see is trees. And you'll say, I don't know where I'm going. I'm lost out here. But stay on the path. As long as you're on the path, you're not lost. You might not know where you're at. <laughs> but you're not lost hallelujah amen hallelujah uh, the, the whole thing Marcel I'm sorry so how many hear where I'm coming from now hopefully today if I'm not long winded I want to get some dialogue because most people think that um, uh, every message is a, a monologue and, and Jesus sat down and let people ask questions. And so many times when he taught, the, the, there was this conversation. And I think a lot of times today when we come to church, we don't have a conversation. We just have the dictates and we need to ha have a time where that we can respond because only by you responding your thoughts can you really get good clarity. That's why when you are, have a really good teacher, they will let you ask questions. Now I know why some people don't like people asking questions because we are afraid that <laughs> we might not have the answer. But a lot of times not having answers could be the answer because it'll make somebody seek out the answer. And do you understand what I'm saying? So I don't mind people asking me something I don't know because they're going to be motivated. It's going to motivate me to find out and it's going to motivate them to search. That's called being on the path. We're walking together on the path. Amen. Uh, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us and not we ourselves. For we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures forever. Uh, uh, bless his name. Seems like an unlikely point to center at on this particular verse, but there is power in bless his name. We skip over those two little, little words and we keep continue with that psalm and not understand that that is the whole key to wealth in life. Bless his name. Now, one of my favorite writers, one of my favorite preachers, one of my heroes of the past, a preacher that would, would definitely, I'm sure, um, made an explosion in the halls of heaven when he stepped foot in heaven. He had some quirks. He wasn't perfect, you know. Uh, he was a cigar smoker, yet he was one of the greatest preachers that ever preached on the planet. His name was Spurgeon. Now, uh, um, he was the hero of my youth. I always said, Lord, 
Man, if, if I could be a black Spurgeon, I would want to be that. You know, this, Lord, this guy, this dude was bad for days. He was, you know, um, here's what he said about this. Our Lord would have, uh, let me start. Our Lord would have all his people rich in high and happy thoughts concerning his blessed person. Jesus is not content that his brethren should think meanly of him. It is his pleasure that his espoused one should be delighted with his beauty. We are not to regard him as we are not to regard him as bare necessity, like bread and water, but as a luxurious delicacy, as a rare and ravishing delight. To this end, he has revealed himself as the pearl of great price and its peerless beauty as the bundle of mirth and its refreshing fragrance as the rose of Sharon in its lasting perfume as the lily in its spotless purity. What was he getting at? He was getting at what is extremely radical. What makes a Christian wealthy? What makes a Christian wealthy? What is the wealth of a believer? What, what is that substance that we have that sets us apart? sets us apart from the kings of the earth that, that, that had diamonds on their, on, on their heads and crowns and, 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 and rubies and, 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 and sapphires on their fingers and, and gold chains hanging off their bodies and, and the power to command and rule the, uh, with authority the governments that they were over. What sets a believer apart that makes Every believer make that kind of wealth pale into what they have been given by God. It's Jesus. Bless his name. What do we do? Why do we bless his name? You see, if you're not saved, you don't get it. If you don't know the Lord, you don't get it. Because you don't have it. <laughs> Amen. When you get it, it, you'll know what you have and you'll rejoice. And, and no loss on this earth will affect you because you'll understand I still have the main thing that, that can be given by God that will lift me above all of the trials, all of the tribulations, and all of the troubles that happens to me in a lifetime. I have Him. I have Christ. I have the Lord of Lords. I have the King of Kings. He lives inside of me. He is my Lord. He is my Savior. He is my rock of my salvation. I have him. He is my wealth. Amen. Yeah, amen. Do you understand? Yes. Praise God. And so when we understand what we have, then we don't need piles of gold to satisfy our passions. You might say, well, pastor, are you, are you anti people having stuff? That's not even the issue. But most people are so addicted to the things of this world, they don't understand that they're junkies already. There's a craving, there's a craving that 
that is in us that says, I got to have more, give me more, 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 more stuff, more stuff, more stuff. That's all I have. I never have enough. More, more, give me more. <laughs> and we're addicted. People said, oh, I hate hanging out around junkies. You're a junkie. You love the junk. You're on the junk. You live for the junk. You work for the junk. Man, your house is a junkyard. You got the junk. You're a junkie. <laughs> Praise God. Are you with me? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 1 Timothy 6, 5 to 12. It talks about great gain or the greatest acquisition. The greatest acquisition. What is, what is the greatest thing that we can acquire? What is, what, is, what is our greatest acquisition? And, you know, Paul begins to deal with us about that. What is, what is our, um, you know, we have to understand also there's a contrast between heaven's wealth and the riches of this world. Jesus' preaching brought men into a strange, almost mystical uh, understanding when he espoused his radical value system in um, when he was preaching in on the Beatitudes. This this was a radical way of thinking that blew people away because the wealth that he was offering only God could give, and nobody in the world could take it away. Like a song we used to sing years ago, this joy I have, the world didn't give it to me. And the world can't take it away. And so that's what makes believers unique because, you know, when you are a true believer, people will say, you know, what would it, what would I give you or do to you that could make you deny your faith? And the thing is, is this, is that when you are a true believer, death itself is not even an issue because we know that what has been given us transcends even death. So martyr me. And so that's why we had the weird behavior of the believers in the early church that were willing to be the lamppost at Nero's games. What, was, what did that mean? It meant they were willing to be wrapped in lamb's wool and rags and oil poured over them and stuck on a pole and lit on fire. And all they had to say to not burn is that I no longer follow Jesus. But they said, it's too pricely. I can't give him up. You might beat me. You might send me to the lions. You might burn me alive. But what I have is too valuable. So burn me alive, feed me to the lions, whip me, beat me, take away my wealth, take away everything I have, strip me naked, parade me through the streets, but I'm not giving them up. I'm not giving them up because he is too valuable. Oh my God. Hallelujah. See, <laughs> today we would look at these ragtagged street people that lived in shabby shacks as the poor. But Jesus looked at them and looked over them and said, blessed. <laughs> well. Blessed. Praise God. Blessed. Because they had something that came from God. Now, are you still with me? Oh, yeah. uh, Jesus 
was tempted by Satan. And the first thing Satan does, well, one of the first, uh, the middle thing that Satan said to Jesus after he couldn't get Jesus to eat was, um, all these things I will give to you. All these things will I give to you if you fall down and worship me. All these things. And the, the scripture says he showed him all the kingdoms of the world, all of the emperors, all of the kings, all of the wealth, all of the gold that was in the ground, and all of the diamonds that had been ripped from the earth by some poor soul that got nothing of it. All of the jewels, rubies and diamonds, he stacked them up and piled them up and said, Christ, this is what I will give you if you fall down and worship me. And some people might say, well, can the devil deliver? He has numerous times. <laughs> You know, you know, because you see, even if he does do it, you're still getting a bad deal. You might be driving a Bentley. You might be living in a five million dollar mansion. You might be wearing uh, a ruby slippers. You might you might have a, a diamond as big as my fist, but you got ripped off. Yes, yes, yes. You got ripped big time. Because you mixed out on the real wealth. Amen. And you've been given trinkets that pale. For what God has for them that love him. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, hallelujah. I mean, see, I could, I, I could, I could preach like a madman today. Because I don't know what happened, but it's in me. It's in, I could preach like a madman. Praise God. Let me tell you something. Then the Apostle Paul puts it like this with this contrast. He says, men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such, withdraw yourself. Can you believe that? There were actually people at that time, and we know that they don't exist today, but there were people at that time that was using a relationship with God in, 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 in abusing the church and abusing people to gain money. Yeah. And they were literally telling people the way to get closer to God is to get more stuff. Well, have more things live like this be like us we have diamonds we have jewelry we we are the financial elite walk with us this is what God wants for your life thank God that happened way back then <laughs> praise God there's 2,000 years that separates us from what was happening and what Paul was warning Timothy about. So thank the Lord and say, Lord, I thank you that I'm not in the danger of that. And then the Apostle Paul, which I really love, he contrasts the good against the evil and lets us compare the two in his dialogue and discourses. And he says, now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing in this world, and it is certain that we will carry nothing out. And he's talking about material stuff. There is one thing you can take out this world, and that's God in your heart. And that will pay for eternity. Paul says this is the attitude that we should have. Now, I don't know about you, but when I first read these scriptures, the implications of them caused the battle in my soul. Maybe not you, but in my soul, it caused, the, it caused a ruckus and a battle in my soul. It says, and having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. What? Be content? 
God, what about Macy's? What about God? What about, Lord, my designer jeans? Lord, I want not just Levi's, give me some St. John's, God. Come on, y'all, looking at me like that. Paul was, you know, and, and see, um, being a person, uh, myself, and, and, and y'all know that I'm human, praise God, same weaknesses, so I have the same thoughts that anybody else. Lord, uh, wait a minute. Are, are you telling me here that I need to just learn how to be happy without, without what I got? And then Paul really hits it hard here, and I don't know about you, but boy, this, this really got the wrestling on in my spirit. But those who desire to be rich, I don't know about you, but in my mind I was saying, well, heck, God, everybody wants to be rich. Everybody, not everybody, but just everybody want to be rich. <laughs> everybody, Lord. <laughs> Shoo. <laughs> see, y'all looking at me like, see, I mean, see, I don't know what struggle's going on in your soul. I'm saying, I'm saying, ah, uh, can we cut this part out? <laughs> everybody, did, everybody did desire. <laughs> I don't even want to, you don't even want me to want to, Lord? I mean, uh, you know, so, Lord, can I want to, but maybe not to, but can I just at least want to? Because everybody want to. <laughs> Be rich. Praise God. <laughs> but who desire to be rich fall into, uh oh, temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown listen you know i don't know about you but have you i i've been i've swam i, uh, I used to really love to swim and um i've had some close calls because i love being in the water and 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 think i could do something but couldn't you know, and I'll swallow a bunch of water and not know if you're going to make it and need help and stuff like that. Drowning, or at least the beginning of drowning, is a horrible feeling to have water go down into your lungs and you're not being able to push anything up and you feel like you're going to die. Drowning is a horrible way to go. But the Bible says that you can drown in this stuff. Drown men in destruction and perdition. And then here's the famous scripture that everybody in the world knows, but they get it wrong. It says, for the love of money, not money, but the love of money. See, if, if money was the root of all evil, then that would mean that you can't have no money. So when you go to work and you work your 80 hours that week and, and they bring you your paycheck and you says no I can't have no money keep that keep that evil stuff away from me <laughs> you know you know you're running okay why is he running because we're trying to give him his money <laughs> okay all right did anybody warn me that sometimes I can be long-winded preacher <laughs> you know so how many of you guys have run on payday? Please, don't give me that paycheck. It's evil. It's evil. It's money. Don't touch it. Kids, don't touch that. That's a nickel. It could kill you. <laughs> there it is. Quick, quick, mom. Get that money away from those kids. <laughs> okay. All right. Money. Money. No, it's the love of money. And this is where Paul begins to, to dive into the issue. First of all, there's the shock and awe when he says your, your desire. 
And then what is he really saying? For the love of money is the root of all evil, all kinds of evil. In other words, every, listen, every evil you can find is because money is involved. I always say, if you want to find out what's wrong, follow the money trail. Somebody's loving it somewhere and they're willing to do anything for it. That's why right now they got fentanyl pills on, on, in the, passed out in the community. People get high one time, they get high and die. Yeah. One time, one pill, high and die. You know, actually, it's bad business because if you kill all your customers, you're not going to make much money, but they don't care. We just get new customers, high and die. And people, and people will take the risk. I, I'm going to get high this time, and maybe I might not die, but they say eventually everybody that tries it dies. And so it is a death. It's not like, oh, I'm not going to die. No, you, if you try it the first time, you don't die. That's, that's cool. You made it. You tried the second time, you might not die. But listen, your number <laughs> will be up. Pretty, you're going to get the right pill. You're going to get high, and you're going to die. Whew. Okay. The Bible says the. Uh, all kinds of evil for which some have strayed. Now this is talking about even believers from some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Somebody said, amen, pastor. I'm still with you. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Come on. <laughs> All right. Praise the Lord. Now I'm, I'm a pastor and I'm not here to entertain you. I'm here to give you life advice from the Word of God that's going to help you have a successful life. Praise God. Amen. That's, that's, that's what God has called me to do. I want to see people blessed. Amen. I don't want you to follow me. I want you to follow God. Or follow me as I follow Christ. But it's all about Him. Amen. Amen. A little saying that came to me, wealth is not about how much you own, it's about who owns you. In Luke 16, 11, you don't have to turn for there, but Jesus uh, broaches this conversation that went on, therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit you to the true riches? Contrast there, there is the unrighteous mammon. What does it mean, the unrighteous mammon? It means the substance of this world. And when it's talking about unrighteous, it's not necessarily meaning ungodly, but it means it's not that that supplies that that man most needs. It does not make him righteous, it's just the common. And mammon is money, and there used to be a god that was mammon, and on and on. So unrighteous mammon simply just means money, your wages or whatever. If you're not faithful in substance that is temporal, who is going to give you the true riches? And so Christ makes that contrast with the Apostle Paul. If you, if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? So God teaches us that we need to be faithful in our work. Um, and then Jesus gets to the crux of the match matter in which the Apostle Paul plays off of. And he says, no servant can serve two masters. He will either hate the one or love the other, or he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So you cannot serve God and money. You see, the thing is, is this, is that God has to own you. And when your money owns you, Satan owns you. When your money owns you, Satan owns you. And so it's not money. 
it's me. At first, it, it comes down to it in God's system. Does God own you? And you have to recognize that you are, are a steward over what you have and nothing truly belongs to you. You know, my kids don't, didn't care that much about that when they were growing up that, or I didn't when I was a kid growing up. I didn't care that my father's money uh, <laughs> was in his pocket because I knew that I had the keys to his pocket. You know, I mean, you know, uh, his wealth was my wealth. How, how many understand? I mean, I, I mean, I had a really good dad. And so, man, I was totally blessed under his roof. I mean, I, I could say I was literally spoiled under his roof. You know, I had the shiniest, and don't, don't get mad at me, I had the shiniest six guns when I was a kid because it was popular when I was a kid to play cowboy and Indians. And so I had I had pearl, not, not plastic handles, my six guns had pearl handles. You know, and I was the fastest draw in the neighborhood except the kid on the other side of the block who I wanted to knock in the head. You know, man, I had my own, I had my own BB guns. I mean, of course it's different now, you know, parents don't get BB guns. I had a BB gun, nine millimeter. And I had my Daisy rifle. Man, I, I mean, I, I had the stuff. You know what I'm saying? I'm in, I mean, you know, I, I didn't just have a regular bicycle. I had a chrome fendered bicycle made out of real chrome. Man, I was bad for days. But, you know, people wanted to always steal my bicycle. And I was, it was real. I mean, it was real. But why? Because I was owned by my dad. I was under his authority. And he blessed me. And so you know, I'm going I'm to really be so, tell you something. I really didn't care that much about stuff because I had a daddy. <laughs> oh, see, y'all get it. Next week sometime it'll come to you. I, I had I had a... I, I had, I, had, I had a daddy, and he told me, he said, somebody came up and stole some of my stuff. He says, why are you upset? I said, they stole my stuff. He says, I'm your daddy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm your daddy. He said, he said we'll just replace it. Apparently, they didn't have it. But... I, I can still, he said, you know, he, he, you know, his thing was, son, I can do this all day long. You know, I could do this, you know, you wake up tomorrow, I could do it again. You wake up the next, I could do it again. You, you, next week, I can still do it. I'm your father. And I'm more than, now, now this is my natural father. And that's why, that's really helped me a lot when I got saved, understand my Heavenly Father. It really helped me in a big way, is that, is that I have a Father. And, 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 and I don't have to cling and hold on to stuff and worry about stuff and worry about loss and, and what's going to be gone. And, 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 and I don't have to have that, I don't have the hang-ups. And, and you know, I was the most worst-dressed kid in the neighborhood because I knew I could have any pair of jeans I wanted anytime I wanted them, but I always felt like the two pair that I have, that's, that's good enough. Because I, I had no worry about I gotta have something more because I felt like what I have is enough and if I want something more, I can always get it. I know it's there, but this is what I want right now. Well, you'll get it. Have I preached too long, or do you want me to go further? Uh, okay, okay. Not too much longer, though. Wealth is not about how much you own. It's about who owns you. Praise God. Um, the good confession. But you owe God... But you, O oh man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, 
and godliness and faith, love and patience, gentleness, fight the good fight of faith, lay out, lay up for eternal, lay your life up for eternal life on which you were called to have and have a good confession in the presence of many witnesses. This subject in which I thought was just going to be a real brief, easy subject to get through has turned, it's like opening a box and things just keep coming out and you're saying, Lord, I just intended for this just to be a, a brief little subject on to the next thing. And it's morphed into so many uh, different things. In Galatians 5.22, it talks about the inner wealth of a transformed, a transformed person, not a person that has conformed himself religiously, but a transformed person that has trusted and embraced God. And so what grows in his heart is um, love, peace, long-suffering, kindness, and faithfulness, which are the fruits of the Spirit, gentleness, and self-control. Uh, this is a natural process uh, when, you, when you're owned by God and you embrace his presence and you allow him into your spirit, this is not something that you have to work on to do. In other words, um, uh, God is not saying necessarily here, go and love people, but he's, he is saying, allow the Holy Spirit to love people through you. It's so much easier to allow God to do it than to try to love people because you want to please God. You know, because if you're trying to do it yourself, you're going to run into some obstacles. Some people that are going to be so ugly, you can't love them. It's going to take the spirit of God for you to love some people. There are some people that are just not lovely. They're not they're not going to be nice to you. They're not going to be they're, they're going to be they're going to be cruel to you. I think about um, uh, some Christians that were put into the concentration camps. Um, during the Second World War. And they were there because they loved Jews, God's people. But yet, at the same time, they had to love the Nazis that were putting them there. What a paradox. You know, what a paradox. I love the person that's hating, and I love the person that's being hated on, but yet I have to turn around and love the person that's causing the hate. You can't do that in your own spirit. It has to be the spirit of God. We're talking about still wealth in the inside. And so the spirit will give you joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, and faithfulness, cause you to be gentle and have self-control. For me, the big thing there is self-control. I know how spirit-filled I am when I get in front of a box of chocolate. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. All right. Um, I'm going to stop here. Uh, next week I'll finish up. I didn't intend for this to go three weeks, but next week I'll finish up on this because um, I want... I want to talk to you, I want you to talk to me briefly about how does that impact you as an individual when you, when we talk about godliness with contentment is great gain. What is that? What is that? I mean, what are, you know, what are we really getting out of this when we become a believer and we begin to walk for Jesus and we're beginning to, you know, he hasn't called us to take a vow of poverty, but he tells us not to allow ourselves to be engaged in the system that is just for ourselves in, in, and that our chief motivation is, is just to get something more at anybody's expense. You know, uh, how can we live free from that system? He's not telling us that we should not um, 
have any kind of wealth. That's not really what he's saying. And I think that's where a lot of people miss that. They feel like, well, well, you know, Christ is telling us that, um, that we're not supposed to have any kind of wealth. Let me just give you a, a, a good verse on that. And this is what King Solomon, the richest, not richest man and the wisest man that ever lived. And he was a man of God until he backslid and came back again. <laughs> you know, a lot of us, we like a life that's perfect, but his life was not perfect. He began strong with God uh, and the wealth of this world did take him out for a while and he regained his sanity and came back. Here's what he says. Here is what I have seen. It is good and fitting for one to eat and drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor in which he toils under the sun all the days of his life, which God gives him. For it is his, listen to this, it is his heritage as, of, as for every man to whom God has given riches, God gives riches and wealth, and given him power to eat of it, to receive his heritage and rejoice in his labor. Wow. Some are saying, wow, we've gone 360 or 180 degrees. This is the gift of God, for he will not dwell unduly on the days of his, all the days of his life, because God keeps him busy with the joy of his heart. And really what he is saying here is that God has given every person a purpose and a work, and that purpose in the work that he gives them will give them a heritage and many of them, it will make them wealthy and rich. And they'll have a great life and they'll enjoy their life. And this is a contrast, but all of this without being greedy and engaged in the world system. See, I've thrown a lot of balls at y'all this morning. But you see, the thing is, is that a lot of times I find that people don't take time and really search out really what Christ is really saying and what the scriptures are really saying about the kind of lives we really have. And really what it boils down to is that God wants to give us a life, but he doesn't want our life to be given away to foolishness. Amen. So for a few minutes, let's, let's talk as I sit these bones down and, uh, and you might want to say something. Because this is very, this is really important because this is, this is about your life. You know, you know, why send your kids to college and then tell them, now go to college and come back and be poor. <laughs> you want them to be successful in life. You know, one of the big words in all of America is be successful. Next week, we'll talk about a little bit what does that really mean in a biblical sense to be successful, you know, so but we can talk a little bit about that. You know, how do we determine what is really success? You know, um, if you and I'm going to say this and it's going to sound mean, but if you're pursuing some kind of American dream, you're going to run into a great nightmare really quick. And I'm a loyal American, but I know that life is not about pursuing happiness because happiness can run faster than you can <laughs> you'll never catch it <laughs> it won't let you catch it it has to be something that you have that God has given you inside of yourself you can't chase it down like it's a deer shoot it and devour it like it's some kind of prey happiness is not that so, engage me, saints. Yes, brother. I think, um, you know, I think the first thing, obviously, we live in America, and because we we're born in this country, we could have been born anywhere else, but we we're born in a wealthy land, just like 
you didn't choose to be born to the father that you had. You just happened to be born to a, That's the way a father that, you know, he, he just set things up differently in yeah. life, right? Yeah. So we have a heavenly father that has positioned us, mm -hmm. right, to where if we choose to maximize our gifts and our talents and our abilities, that he has put us in a place where we can be, we can be made wealthy because of what he has given That's us true. and where he has placed us, right? And that is not of our own, we just got placed here. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that to say that a lot of times we take things for granted, just like your dad was trying to explain to you. You didn't really understand at first that like, hey, it's like I could just get it again. Right? It was nothing to him. To you, it was like, but the kid stole it. I think once you have the recognition of what you have, what you actually have, in order to stay humble with that when you are blessed, you need to wake up every day with an attitude of gratitude. Amen. I, I don't know any other way to humble yourself than to give God thanks for what you have because you understand, and this is not even in comparison to anybody else. You know, I, I just personally, I say, God, I want what you have for me. Not for nobody else. I, I don't care what they got, what they do. I they only got. want what you have for me. And if there are desires in my heart that only you know would be harmful for me, yeah. then I don't want that. And that's where the Lord's Prayer comes in. Give us this day our daily bread, right? Give me what is best for me today, God. Yes, yes. Can, I, can I live can I be obedient to you today? And and, I, and and focusing so much on our tomorrows can cause great anxiety. It doesn't mean that we don't plan, but let me execute my plan today. And I don't have to worry about tomorrow if I do what I'm supposed to do today. So I think an attitude of gratitude is very important. And I also think that as people who are blessed, you need to be sewing into other people. Yeah. Let me just say this, and real quick, I want to say this, just want to add to that, what he said, and then we'll go straight to Queen. This is really important. That's why he said, Godliness, this has been our center of scripture, Godliness uh, with contentment is great gain. And this is all Solomon was really saying here, is that the, the acquisition of contentment uh, is something that has to be contemplated to gain. It doesn't just happen naturally. You have to really focus on what God is giving you there. And I believe God sets it up that way so that we can be intentional on the way that we live our lives. That we, we really make a decision, what is the most important thing? One thing that my youngest son asked me when he was about 12 years old was, when is enough enough? And, and you know, because he thought he was going to grow up and become wealthy. And he wanted to know, when is enough enough? When will I have enough? And I let him know. I said, that has to be a decision in your heart between you and God. And see, the problem is that contentment is very important because if you don't learn how to be content, no matter how much God blesses you, you will be dissatisfied. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's where gratitude comes from. And you see, uh, if you are not satisfied in your soul and your spirit with what God has blessed you with, no matter how meager it is, but if you can't live a life with joy and understand that your significance is no less than anybody else's regardless of what somebody else has, because what someone else has does not diminish who you are. That's a big deal. Mm -hmm. And in this culture, I'm going to tell you, in this culture, it's a, it's a deal that actually those that are in control do not want you to ever have because that means they won't be able to sell as much stuff because they know that most of the things that we grab and gravitate to is because of our own lack of really who we feel we are in the inside and, and, and the inconsistency in our own soul and we think we can fill it with more money and more things. 
you know, I'm serious. You know, uh, if you can't if you can't be happy with hot dogs in the backyard with your kids, you're not going to be happy when you go to Hollywood and uh, or or go to uh, the islands or someplace and you have your children. That's not going to make you happy because if you can't be happy at home, you know. How in the world do you think you're going to be happy because you flew over an ocean and landed in some exotic place? Mm -hmm. You're still going to be the still the same dissatisfied soul there as you were in your own backyard. You know, uh, places do not make you happy. Things do not make you happy, and then those things satisfy you. That's why the Bible says, "Godliness with contentment is great gain." God. Next week we'll talk about injustice, but this this is an important subject because we need to get a handle on this and we're going to help other people. Mm -hmm. We need to get now, and this is not about the po of poverty because people think when you talk like this, you're talking about oh, God just wants you to be satisfied because He's not going to give you any more. That's not the premise of it. You know, the premise of is whatever you have is enough. Mm -hmm. the, word, word, the, the original word from the uh, Greek language means I'm satisfied because I am completely sufficient with what I have. I am, I am not, I am not handicapped with what I have in my economic level. Or where I'm not handicapped. I am not insufficient in what I have. God has supplied and met my every need. Mm -hmm. Oops. Now, I, I can hear some minds right now thinking, what? What, Pastor? Okay, cute. I, I think what I'm going to say is kind of redundant. I think it's going to kind of cover some of most of what we've always said. Um, you know, I you know I think that I've heard a lot of things uh, kind of my own subject. Uh, <laughs> but someone said, to the body that lies. Um, despair is not found in pain, but uh, in excess pleasure, because we have we have put so much stock in in our happiness and our joy or whatever it is that was going to lift us out of our doldrums and and set us to a place of contentment, and um, we come to a place of recognition that. Those things did not do, did not deliver, but delivered more of poverty of mind and spirit. When we have this excess that was supposed to have done one thing, but it did something else. And and like a junkie, and not and, and without recognition, that we continue to go after the thing again and again and again, as if we were insane. You know, God does, God, God puts in us his will to do his good pleasure. And I think that there's a scripture that I really, really like that I believe that is companionship, a companion scripture to love. And it says, do nothing through selfish ambition or conceit, but lowliness of mind, just being humble. Yes, there we go. And looking not after your own interests, but the interests of others. Yeah. And this is the mind that was in Christ that should be in us as well. So he became impoverished so that we could become wealthy, not in the, the things of the world so much as it is in spirituality. So I just kind of hit me for the real moment, I mean, about the fruit of the spirit. It is not something that we necessarily learn, obtain, and ingrain in ourselves through our own ways, right. but as you said, through the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. the fruit of the Spirit, that God's good will, in, so that we may do His good pleasure right. through the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And that is the joy, the love, the self-control, and all of those things. Um, and as we move closer to God, and as we, we, we are able to uh, be transformed, that old man dies, and so the new man may live. And that is only through Christ. All right.
Thank you. Well, I think I've taken up a lot of time. Well, I want to ask yeah. one more thing, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Because this is great and I appreciate it. Um, I think a lot of times what can happen, especially with church folks, is I think there could be a lot of false humility too because people begin to try to downplay the fact that you want to be successful or have something right. better for your life, right? And so you start saying stuff like, I don't need, no, it never was about that you need it. Your needs are met. Mm -hmm. But you have always taught us if you only live a life to create enough to only take care of you, that's a very small life. That's very, very selfish. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, once you do have an attitude of gratitude, once you are content in what God has given you, I want you to speak to the desire to continue to go further, right? The desire to create more. I mean, because God puts these dreams and these ideas and we come together and we make plans. We're never planning to do something small. So obviously if we want to do something big, there has to be something created to do the big thing. Mm -hmm. okay. And so I, I just know personally for me, I don't have small dreams. I want to be a go-to guy. I want to be an impact person. And so I'm saying, God, take me as far as I could go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, That's good. here's, the, here's the, uh, the thing on that. That's what Solomon was saying, saying that God gives us all a purpose. He gives us the ability to find our work. Now, this, this is a whole other subject. Most people never find their work. Mm -hmm. They just get a job. Right here. <laughs> Most people never find work. They just get a job. There is, as the world would say, that sweet spot. That when you find that purpose, it will produce enough for your life and the lives around you. Yes, sir. And uh, yours may not be mine, mine may not be yours, but but God wants to give you that. And the Bible says, like we just said, that you will eat from that all the days of your life and it will be the joy of your life. Now, most people just have a job, but they never found their work. Yeah. And they don't know their purpose. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I stumbled on this in my, in my own life, and I didn't, I didn't know, I didn't manage it properly because I always said I'm never gonna, I don't want to. I understood this as a young person, but I didn't know how to manage it because I never wanted to do any kind of job that was not my work. Sometimes you gotta do a job to find your work. Yes. Yeah. Otherwise, you will start to Now, I didn't understand that when I was younger. You know, yeah. so so get a job. You know, and don't you know just you know just don't sit down and you know uh, you know. But the thing is, this along the way you will find your work. Yes. And that work will prosper your life and bless others. Because most people don't understand they have a destiny and a purpose. That's true. And when you find that destiny and purpose and you find your work, it will be that fruit that will fill your life. And it does exist no matter where you're born, where you live on the planet, God has a destiny, a purpose, and a work for you. Praise God. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. If, 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 if I could just ask one question, just one question, and, and it's from the scripture that you read. And, and it's back in Luke 16, 12. And, and if you are not capable with other people's things, why should you be trusted with the things of your own? Yes. Who has my stuff that I don't have? So I, I got that, that scripture always kind of throws me just a curveball. <laughs> throws me a curveball enough that, that I, uh, I can't just, I can't get my head around that. That, that statement there, that question. Yeah. Who should trust you with the things of your own? That I don't understand. I don't how I don't understand either the syntax of that question uh, and, and, and what it's really trying to get to. Because if if, if it's my own, shouldn't I have it already? Or are we talking about something in the future? I, I just don't understand the question. 
Okay. Really what it's dealing what it's dealing with what it's dealing with there is that let me let me go through it really quick. If, if this is your first time at BLCC, you might say, wow, these people, but we we only meet once a week. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, and so what makes the other, the other seven days important is that, you know, you have an opportunity to really deal in scripture, amen? Amen. So, but we don't force you to stay, I mean, you guys are forcing me to stay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. I'm trying to look for it. Okay, here we go. Um, we were in Luke 16, right? Yeah. And, uh, okay, it says. Uh, Therefore, if you have not been faithful in unrighteous mammon, in other words, working for somebody else, who will commit to your trust true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another man, who will give you what is your own? Mm -hmm. And what, it, what it's saying there is that if I'm working for you and I don't care about your stuff, in other words, it's just a job to me. Mm -hmm. and, and and I'm going to come in 10 minutes late and leave 15 minutes early and, and still want to be paid a full day's wage. And that my attitude is just whatever needs to be done, that'll do. In other words, I don't give the full intensity of myself as if it was my own. The Bible is saying, then who's going to give to you? In other words, Who's going to pass on to you that that belongs to you so that you can be in charge? Mm -hmm. Someday you're going to be in charge. And um, who's, in, a, in other words, how are you even going to become in charge if you can't <laughs> be in charge of something and care about something that somebody else is? Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, and so when we are not faithful to work or our jobs or where we are, it means that you really don't care about something because you're not vested in it. And that makes you a small person because if you can only be vested in yourself and not into somebody else, then you're a limited person. That's right. Because all you care about is you, and that's greediness mm -hmm. and selfishness. And it's a very shallow person. You know, and people will say, well, the job don't care about me. Boss making seven hundred times more, much more money than me. Why should I give it? You know, why should I care? You know, he's a CEO. You know, you know, CEO make about seven hundred times more than me. <laughs> you know, so that makes him a lot, making a lot of money. But, but the thing is, is this: we we'll, we'll we'll make that as an excuse. They're getting wealthy off of my labor. You know, you know, I'll, like for instance, that boy. You know. Uh, when I left there years ago, I, I always said I was making an extravagant amount of money, but I think my base salary was I have a child something over $40 an hour. That was it. That was just base, but that wasn't what, that was, that it was not including overtime and stuff like that. So, you know, if I just really wanted to push the envelope, if I really was intense, which I wasn't intense enough, about it, but if I wanted to be intense, they easily did double a, a two hundred grand a year of that's what the crew that I was working with made. They made that kind of money because they were willing to be there at any time and work their butts off. And I wasn't a butt worker. <laughs> um, I wasn't a butt worker off. <laughs> but there were people that, you know, that was their their level of intensity. You know. And some of the guys that made half as much and I was, I did make more money than me because they worked the bus off. Okay? So, the thing was, the thing that I was trying to get at is that you need to be faithful. You need to be faithful to what? To whomever God has placed you under as your job 
and treated with the same intensity and passion as of what of what um, you would do for yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, but a lazy person is not going to work for himself or anybody else. That's another fact you need to understand too. That if you don't care about yourself, you don't care about nobody else, and it's a non-flex situation anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, definition of success is what I think we're really going for next week. We're going to talk about that. Definition of, of success in our culture, and also from Hebrew point of view, from the Old Testament, and also from um, New Testament point of view, and, and what those two concepts meant when you, when you brought them to, together. And so we're going to deal with that on next week. Now, I know that this kind of teaching and preaching is not the kind of thing that gets everybody super excited and not turning flips. I know in the beginning when I was preaching a little bit because I was excited, you know, but I have to be a teacher also. It's important to me that I impart onto you wisdom so that you can live the Bible the other six days. That's right. See, how I only get you on, on Sunday that the other six days you can put these things in practice. That was, and the big part of church is, is when you leave this, these doors. Mm -hmm. It's not the event, but it's what you do when you leave these doors. And I don't see you all week. Praise God. Some of you, I don't see you every week. I see you once a quarter. So this might have to do for a whole quarter. Till I see, till I see you in February. <laughs> all right. <laughs>